I'm happiest in the saddle. <laughs> a fellow sportsman. I am an FBI agent. Great Scott. What do you say we cut the chit chat? A hole. Dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Come with me if you want to live. Hello. And welcome to Retro Ramble. I'm Charlie McGee. I'm George McGee. And this month, we're going to be traveling back to 1987 to review the cult classic that is Dirty Dancing. And George, we can't do this alone, can we? Certainly not. It's a, uh, it's a big film for a lot of ladies out there. And so we got the lady that we've watched this film the most with, I would say, our dear sister, Sophia. Welcome to Retro Ramble. Hello, thank you for having me. Finally managed to get her on board. Yeah, a lot of bullying. She is our I'm older sister. I'm so excited. I am your older sister. I've been feeling a bit left out, you know, you two doing this on your own, so... She found out about the podcast, demanded <laughs> to be on it, and demanded that it was Dirty Dancing. Yep. We hope it's the first of uh, many podcasts of this Well, nature. yes, I think uh, as we sort of go through this episode, we may uncover a few other Potential. That, yeah, things to cover. Confessions of films for men for young girls that George and I obsess over. Uh, so, Mainly including mu- musicals. So in this uh, episode, we will be discussing uh, some interesting wardrobe decisions, some sexy air thrusting dancing. Amazing choreography. With some snake hips, some sweaty Swayze, some sexy Swayze. There's there's a lot of love in about Patrick Swayze, to be honest. Um, but for everybody who's uh, listened to our podcast before, this one's a bit different, guys. Um, so hope it's attractive some girls to download and take a listen for anyone who's not listened here's george with a quick word on some general housekeeping yes so the purpose of this podcast is uh usually charlie and myself will go through the films of our youth uh this time we have our lovely sister uh, guesting joining on our journey going back looking at these films so we are we're film lovers we're not film professionals we're podcast professionals, podcast professionals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. so yeah we will be going through these films in detail there will be spoilers from the very off will be yeah having an affectionate look back what holds up what may have dated what makes them cult classics etc there may be some colorful language there's not going to be many car chases or time machines or sci-fi no there's very little uh, you know explosive action there's, there's there's definitely explosive action of a different type in this film yeah but uh, there may be some impressions uh you know i few, think there's some know. impromptu singing some bad impromptu yes. singing from from myself and and, and, and all of us uh, yeah all of no, us no no yeah. you're not that stupid so yeah um i think i think that's it essentially an enjoyable divergence from what we normally cover so yeah here it is um, um, with it being the 80s, we're recording this on cassette or vinyl, if we go back as far yeah, as Yeah, I think we, let's go back to 60s. So we're recording this on yeah. vinyl. Um, so here it is, uh, 1987, Dirty Dancing. Enjoy. Enjoy. The heat is in the music. Music sets you dancing. The dancing sets her free. Best Wrong Pictures presents Dirty Dancing. She thought it would be just another summer vacation. Who's that? Oh, them. They're the dance people. But it turns out to be the time of her life. Let's be now! I can't even do the merengue. He teaches her what she can do. She shows him all he can be. You gotta stop it now. I know what I'm doing, Penny. I'm scared of everything. Most of all, I'm scared of walking out of this room and never feeling the rest of my whole life the way I feel when I'm with you. What they learn from each other feels too good to be wrong. Dirty Dancing. Starring Patrick Swayze, Jennifer Grey, and Cynthia Rhodes. Get ready for the time of your life. So it's 987, just to set the scene. Uh, Other films that we've covered from this year include The Untouchables. Robocop. Lethal Weapon. Oh, yeah, Lethal Weapon, which we did for Christmas. Uh, But in terms of pop culture, what were you listening to back then? Um, Banging pop. 
if you were Sophia, allowed. any ideas? Late 80s? Would it have been Paula Abdul? Yeah. Paula, uh, Kylie was, oh, would have been late, Kylie. Definitely, late, late, late was 80s. Was a little bit of Madonna? Jason. Were, were, had Roxette happened then or were they more early 90s? I kind of always associate I'm getting Roxette Pretty Woman. Yeah. Yeah, so 90s then. That's, 90s. We could get you back for that one as well. Oh. What a, what let's a, see how I go today. Let's see how you get on today. Yeah, yeah. 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 see well, if I pass the Baby steps. And again, that's not a pun. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a pun. So, yeah, it's 1987. It's the 80s. Sorry, I mean, it's the 60s. No, I'm getting confused. Um, how did we get this wonderful cult movie that is Dirty Dancing, George? Um, well, it is it's an interesting one and uh, just sort of a as a preface there's a very good series on Netflix that we've talked about previously because the first series they did was The Toys That Made Us uh, it's on Netflix and now they do the movies that made us and one of those films is indeed Dirty Dancing and it's a really interesting sort of behind the scenes of how the film came to be Essentially, it's a semi-autobiographical account by Eleanor Bergstein. She was called baby herself uh, up until her early 20s. That's hilarious. She spent a lot of time holidaying in the Catskills, which is in uh, New York State. Her father was a doctor, and she used to dirty dance in her <gasps> friend's basements. So um, this was her second script, um, but she said she always wanted to sort of write a script about that sort of youthful experience. So she uh, teamed up with a sort of a, a friend of a friend, uh, Linda Gottlieb, um, who at the time had a deal with MGM, but that fell apart. So they shopped around the script to literally every studio, um, even the, the sort of smaller independent ones, and they all turned it down. Uh, I think it was a mixture of the title and the fact it was... Well, maybe not so much of a rom-com. It was just the, the studios just didn't get it. Um, so they, they, I say, they shopped around everywhere and it was eventually fell into the hands of uh, Vestron Video. Um, so what? A na- what? Sorry, is that a company or a person? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a company. So they were a distributor uh, in Connecticut, so not even in Hollywood. And they were mainly a distributor. So that was back then in the, in the early sort of 80s, early to mid 80s. They were purely hand handling the distribution for other films. So they were a video distributor and they, they mainly specialized in sort of low budget horror, sort of schlocky type stuff. Straight to video. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, straight to video type stuff. But they, so they weren't actually producing the films. They were just, just distributing them. But they wanted to get into film distribution because all the studios were like, well, why are we paying another company to distribute the films? We should be doing it ourselves. So more and more studios were doing distribution in-house. So Vestron were like, well, we need to start making films so they started looking for scripts but because they were quite low level they were looking at the scripts that everyone else had turned down and one of those turned out to be Dirty Dancing and the producer at, that worked at Vestron again had spent a lot of time holidaying in the Catskills and loved it spoke to him personally so that was their first production and so they took a leap I think it cost around I think it had a budget of about four and a half million so say a tenner <laughs> relatively low budget and then they went about looking for a director. So they got uh, an Oscar winner lined up, uh, Emile Ardolino. Um, however, he'd never made a feature film before. He'd won an Oscar for a short film, a documentary that was, importantly, all about dancing. Okay. So at least he had form in that area. But he would go on after this. This was his sort of his feature debut uh, to direct another of Sophia's favourites. Three Men and a Little Lady. Oh, I love that film. Can we do that one as well? Uh, well, it's well been, let's see it's how been you get on today, so Baby Steps, <laughs> as George says. We're already making a long list. Uh, and The First Sister Act as well. So, um, But he, tragically, I think he died of AIDS in 93, so he had quite a sort of short film career. So in terms of casting, obviously, you know, this is, uh, you know, remembered for the two leads. And... Uh, Bergstein, as it was her script, had a lot of, well, basically final say on who was cast in the lead role. She immediately fell in love with Jennifer Grey. Uh, Jennifer Grey, as we were chatting earlier, was uh, popped up in Ferris Bueller as his sister. So she'd mainly had supporting roles. Um, so this was her first lead, but Bergstein sort of saw her as a sort of, you know, a... Saw herself in her. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um she was happy with all the rest of the cast and they were ready to go. Right. <laughs> well, well, we'll get to coulda, woulda, shoulda later, but um, they, she came, uh, Bergstein came across a photo of, she was looking apparently for a lead with hooded eyes and came across a photo of Swayze and was like, that's him. 
But apparently Swayze said on his CV he, that he wasn't, uh, he didn't do dancing. But it actually later emerged that he, the only reason he said that is because he... He was amazing. Well, no, his mother is actually a dance teacher and used to have um, dance-like videos. Yeah. Um, and he's actually a, an amazing dancer, but he'd had a football injury that uh, damaged his knee. So uh, almost like a bit like point break in a way. Wow. So they once they discovered that he actually could dance, he just was a little bit cautious. I want to see that movie. They were like, <laughs> when we discover that Patrick Swayze could dance all along. The Swayze story. The Swayze prequel. Make it happen, George. Um, so yeah, they did various screen tests with different actors. As I say, I'll talk about who almost made it and coulda, woulda, shoulda. But apparently Jennifer Grey and Patrick Swayze had smoldering skin, screen chemistry, I should say. Um, they lit up. Their screen test was like, was on fire. It was... It was like liquid sex, baby. Yeah? Yeah, it was good. It was good. Because they liked each other or they... No, no, they actually hated each other, it turns out. <laughs> um, it's true. But it's called acting, dear boy. Yeah. So, yeah, apparently, Jennifer Grey, uh, because they... That's why the fights are so convincing. <laughs> well, J- Jennifer Grey and Patrick Swayze had been in a previous film, uh, Red Dawn. Um, Sounds like a Cold War video. thriller. Uh, or a straight-to-video porno. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen Red Dawn. I think you might have. Is, is that, I think it's the one where Russia Russians invade America and high school kids have to fight back or something. Not to be confused with toy soldiers. All I'm getting in my ear is, is toy soldiers. Okay. Well, um, so yeah, they, they'd uh, been in that film together and apparently I don't think they got on. So Jennifer Grey actively sort of campaigned to try to make sure that Swayze didn't get the role because she didn't like him. Um, but because everyone else saw they had this despite all this they had amazing characters let's make them work together yeah well it was actually Swayze had to go in and convince her to you know let him have the part because he was passionate about it he really liked the role um, and eventually they managed to work things out and the kind of like in the film was movie making history even in post-production Bergstein had to fight for the abortion subplot because one of their potential sponsors I think was Clearasil and they were like yeah could you just get rid of the abortion subplot and she's like that's pretty much half the movie and a lot of the reasons all the actions happen in well, so it's, it's, I think it's every single per- every single character's arc is linked is to, linked that. to that abortion yeah. thing um, so yeah that's that's the sort of the main overview of of how it came to be so, well should we start with because you know I do this thing where I have to sit here alone and get schooled by George, but you've just gone through it as well. Yeah. Um, shall we go start with first memories and let ladies go first? So, Sophia, what does this film mean to you? When I, when we said to you, well, when you demanded that you'd only come on the podcast, I'm joking, uh, to do Dirty Dads, when, when, you've, when you think of that film, what does that bring back in terms of nostalgia first? And then we'll, we'll talk about what it was like to go back to it recently. Yeah, so I, I was thinking about this. Um, the film came out, I would have been 10, and I definitely didn't watch it when it first no, came out. No, no, it's like so many, it was, it was, the, it was yeah. the age of video. We were probably like watching E.T. and stuff at that yeah. point. Um, so I think I probably discovered it for the first time when I was about 13. So, and I think in my head, it was an old film. But I guess it was. It was three years old. But, but maybe it, it felt of the older period thing. and the period mm. and all of that. We didn't get the whole period thing like we didn't. Yeah, you didn't realise the irony of it being made mm. in the 80s and set in the 60s. I just remember falling in love with it from the first time I watched it. And the music, I mean, the music is amazing. I think we're both on the same, but we're all on the same page I when mean, it comes to the music. What a amazing. soundtrack. What a soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember getting the soundtrack and playing that to death. I can remember you doing can that. Can you remember that? Yes, She's I can. I know the, Swayze. It's like every single, the I first few beats of every single song are ingrained in my head. Can mm. I ask you a question? Yeah. Did Catherine Glendening have anything to do with are we you seeing this? Glendening? Well, that's or what Katie I'm asking. Keeney. I don't... Is there any, no, is there any Stocksfield? No. 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 Um, I must it, have watched it with somebody. You think it might have been with school friends or something? It might have been with school friends, mm. yeah. But I, I mean, because on most of our podcasts, most roads lead back to the Glendennings or the Feenies. <laughs> Do they like get some kind of financial credit for this? Well, they we don't yet, but we're, <laughs> in, we're, we're, in, we're in court with them at the we're moment. Still to, out. Yeah, we're yeah. still trying to iron out a deal, a royalties deal. <laughs> Thank you. 
this I think in terms of how big this film is I remember this being a massive film for you yeah. and for every single girl I knew and for for just it was a moment I mean it's a cult people call it a cult film now but it was a big deal at the time well, wasn't I think it? what's amazing about it is that um, as a 13 year old girl feeling all the things that a it's teenager does it. Yeah. it just completely rings true you've got a baby who's a bit awkward and yes yeah, she's beautiful but it's one of those things you notice her blossoming throughout she, the film she wants she's, to be taken seriously yeah she's fighting to be taken seriously she adores her daddy our she's baby, I- idealistic she's idealistic our she's, baby's gonna change the world <laughs> She, she allows her, her sister. Pa- yeah, she allows her parents to call her baby. Yeah. <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, and then you kind of see her What's blossom, about, don't about you? Journey. To yeah. turn yeah. into a woman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Through the medium of what I like to call, and I will be referring to as the wardrobe reduction montage. <laughs> yes. Yes, <laughs> indeed. It's done very subtly in some scenes, but uh, yeah, it was just, I think, just school trips. I can remember us being yeah. on a school trip, and obviously there was a fight for what, what tape, I don't think it was CD, back then on the bus was put on the bus and there was one and it was just on and I think a few on another school trip it would have been the bodyguard a few years later but it was this and add, that's why to the list and that's add bodyguard to the list so, yeah. to the Sophie list yeah um yes yeah, so, I mean there's it is the, it's one of those films where the soundtrack is as you know I think has stood the test of time and almost was the hook because yeah, that's what you'd listen yeah. to that you could listen to that in the car you could listen to that all the time but maybe you'd sit down and watch the film not as much as you'd listen to the film and now of course um, being married to the man that I am he loves it even more than I do we did not Dirty do that Dancing well, well, well I remember when I asked you if uh, if you wanted to be on the podcast <laughs> and do Dirty Dancing Phil was like well what about me <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> sorry Phil sorry Phil Pear. <laughs> um, but yeah, so anyone that's been in a car with us will know that it's permanently on the playlist. Phil's favourite song ever, Hungry Eyes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, everyone's got a favourite on, yeah. on that. And your yeah. husband does have some interesting musical choices. He does. A lot, a lot of Streisand. <laughs> <laughs> it's very dodgy. Yeah. Um, but no, it's, I mean, it's got some, uh, we've, we've kind of sort of talked about this before but the mix of the 60s like the Motown stuff is amazing but obviously yes there's all the 80s stuff that some of it works in the film some of it it not- shouldn't work but it does yeah so you like you, oh like the she's like the wind yeah kind of works quite well and hungry eyes but there's one of them we were saying is it the pointer sisters one yeah it's that, jarring very jarring yeah, and it's used for about 30 seconds and I think it's just used for that lyrics that we're gonna make a Whatever it is, and it's just Charlie's for, face right now. It's amazing when his when her sister is expecting to have lovey time with mm. Robbie, and Robbie's obviously being the shit that he is, Such and he's a with shit. another lady. Such a and, shit. and then it's cut, oh, and it's just like so that was jarring. And then, to be honest, I think the rest of the soundtrack works really well. And it was only this time um, th- that when it gets to the end scene and they drop the big tune, that it actually occurred to me. Like, but. But this is in the... Were they playing this in the 60s? But we can talk about that when we get to that, yeah. I think. Poetic license. Yeah. So, should we jump in? Yeah, well, I was going to say, in terms of my, my first memories... Nobody uh, cares about you, George. You're the, ba- you're the baby brother in this. Uh, I'm the baby. You're outranked uh, now. Uh, Sophie's here. You're, 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 you're now in the corner, corner. Yeah, literally. The corner. I am the baby of yeah. the in the corner. Um, but no, I kind of remember growing up and being it sort of like, oh, it's so fun, but okay, I will watch it again. But then as I grew up, I sort of, you know, did really, I listened to the soundtrack a lot. And then obviously I, I met Mawath and surprisingly, she's a big fan of it. So yes, it's, I think it's one of Tallulah's five DVDs. <laughs> um, so it's a good one. It's good that there's that. There's Moulin Rouge. <laughs> they're, they're all, I think they're all musicals. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, so um I remember we watched it at uh, they they did an outdoor screening of it in uh, in Newcastle by the by the monument. I think it was a an anniversary for Tyneside Cinema or something. So it was on a big inflatable screen, and the amount of swooning when Swayze first came comes on screen when uh, so dreamy when, in his in his sunglasses and everything. Even though it's a nighttime scene, leather jacket casually tossed over his shoulder, and even I had a little bit of a flutter downstairs. If you know what I mean, just none furling. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> flipped it from God six to sake. midnight. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, shall we uh, get into sort of the the, the film? The, the sort of highlights of the film one of the things I noticed is there's a narration at the start and then it just disappears yeah it's like forgotten about it's literally like Set just letting like, you know it's 1963 
Um, it's okay. time to set the scene. Yeah. So, like, here's a story. But they, you do expect, you, you forget about it. But I was just like, oh, is this throughout? And I was like, did I forget that this has narration throughout? Well, I asked like, myself that as well. No. So I was like, I'm pretty sure I've seen this film a few times. But it's times. a very good setting of the time. It very quickly pulls you in, doesn't yeah. it, with the, the car journey. And as you were saying before, um, that it makes you can quickly relate you know it's like every yeah. young girl's dream is you get right into it you know her outfits all the shoes that her sister should have packed yeah, yeah. um but there's the uh, uh, one of the lines that stood out is the guy who runs the the holiday camp and he's like if it wasn't for your father i'd be standing here dead <laughs> yeah like, that doesn't make any sense. There's some I, there's some some interesting because a lot obviously there's a, a lot of setting the scene. There's a lot said, and it very much sets. It's trying to establish itself as being the '60s, but the dialogue that's used it rings out that it's the '80s. It's mm. like lots of touching. You got to go for the daughters. You got to go for this. You got to go for that. Even the dogs. Even the dogs. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like be careful. There's some guys are nice, but a lot of men are. Oh, are I are I always forget. No matter how. I mean. I'm I've seen this film uh, probably twice in the past uh, six months, I, I will admit. And uh, the, the thing I always forget about is Slimy Neil, you know, the, the junior manager guy. Oh, he's oh, awful. He's brilliant. <laughs> he's so creepy. And it's just he's he's like putting his face grease. <laughs> hey, baby, why don't we uh, go and help me set up the games it's for uh -oh. charades? Yeah. Uh, it's like, oh. It's but it's really like we've horrible. all we've all known somebody like that yeah. just that creepy son I'm of junior manager junior manager yeah it's like Oof. yeah horrible yeah I think there's the guy from Jurassic Park Newton uh, sorry Newman um, yes he's the guy from yeah, Jurassic Small Park supporting sp supporting role um, I think it, what's interesting is that it's if you've been it's obviously going on going to camp is a very big thing in the states and that's why and it's been a very big thing in the states for a long time but i think everybody has been sent away as well, we say to camp at some stage even if it's two weeks down the road or something your parents need a break well i think know? that's why this film sort of resonates with so many people even if uh, you know we always joke about the fact that we grew up in a little village in, in northeast england but everyone's had like a holiday romance or you know fallen in love with somebody it might not be sort of you know go both ways but well, everyone's gone to a family resort yeah you know at least once you know. yeah even if it's butlands yeah you might meet the love of your life at butlands never know uh but there is that sort of class thing going on throughout the film oh yeah i was actually i did i tried to look at this you know analyze it at the end it's like, what is this story actually about it's obviously a, a coming of age uh film very much for for baby what it's francis isn't it yes yeah. beautiful name beautiful name um and because i was um, when I was doing my research for this podcast, we don't research I anything. did some yeah. work on this and they were saying about how um, a baby always wears white and Johnny always wears dark. Oh, and that's she's... to symbolise her innocence and him being from the, she's so the wrong side of the tracks. Yeah. And it's only... Uh, she wears like I think a red dress when she's doing the dance at the yes. club. Yeah. But the rest of the time she's always wearing pale colours. To... Yeah. The wardrobe, yeah. it's definitely a feature. It's, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's, the, it's the character that is never revealed. I mean, I made the joke about the, there is the wardrobe reduction montage, which is they're, they're learning to dance and she's getting, and she's revealing herself. And it's done quite subtly and stuff like that. But there's that, we have to talk about the, the after party in the rec room yeah, whatever it's the called. breakout that room that place whatever. is lit it's like yeah, and I it's every, every night I want to go party there and everyone's just air humping yeah, everyone, a lot of grinding a lot, there's lot. a lot of grinding going on but one of my favourite bits in that is when she dances with Swayze and then he goes away oh, you can and she's left by herself oh and we've God, all that, been in that yeah, situation we've all so been true. say what you want you can pretend that it's never happened but we've all been left by ourselves on a dance floor and then you have to and style we, it out yeah and you're like no no I'm fine I'm by myself I'm gonna keep going I was meant to be doing this no but it's the way he like completely grinds her like yeah. she's never been grinded before and, and he knows what he's doing and then he just like he flips off and he's just like you bastard yeah leave him um, hanging But speaking of fashion, we do have to talk about high waisty Swayze. Oh my god! <laughs> it, but the thing is, it's confusing. It's like a mirage. Like first, there is there is the Swayze. There's the hair. There's the smouldering look. The but chiseled. The chiseled looks. But then there is 
there's something going on upstairs and downstairs. You've got the frilly shirts but, on the top and then the snake hips and the tight pants. And he is in tight pants but in every single scene he's in. Yes. It's I mean, convenient it, it, because he's wearing a tux when he's doing his dances and stuff. And then he's he's relaxing afterwards and he's still got his tux pants on. But but we, we did talk about this uh, in, I think, in Point Break, where he does have a sort of penchant for big flowing open shirts. If you've seen Roadhouse, as, as you have. He, and yeah, and tight pants. Tight pants big flowing shirts it's not, he's very broad though isn't he yeah. some people yes. call it broad fashion on his shoulders so he was kind of like a yes he is broad yes it's almost so, like a triangle so muscular I'm just gonna dab my forehead um, no but it's he is he is captivating and like I was saying to George uh, you know we were talking about how captivating Swayze is yeah, when we were alone together just, just for two hours in the bath <laughs> um, no but the thing is we lost him and it's very sad and like we went to see George and I uh, went to see Roadhouse recently uh, the Tyneside Cinema that got introduced and that is a cult film as well it's sort of like Point Break is a cult film and it's like come on just admit it the world loves Swayze and I wonder what it would be like if we were still around today I mean yeah it would I, be interesting to see him still making films today and he's it's, it's a real because well, I think towards the end of his career he was doing like he was doing some sort of TV detective stuff on t- um but it's one of those things, he, he did a kind of a mini comeback with Donnie Darko, didn't yeah. he? Playing against type, um, which was, you know, a great role for him. You are a prisoner, prisoner of fear. Fear and love. Too many young men and women today are completely paralyzed by their fears. They surrender their bodies to the temptation and destruction of drugs, alcohol, and premarital sex. And yeah, I kind of, and again, yeah, we chatted about this, that he was kind of, if he did, you know, obviously if tragedy hadn't struck and he hadn't got cancer, it kind of feels like he'd be the type of actor that would have a, a comeback of Absolutely. sorts. Absolutely. Whether it's like a Tarantino-esque comeback or some sort of form that he would have turned up changed, in Marvel. He'd have to change his look. <laughs> yeah, because his look suited the time he was an actor. Unless he just 80s kept and 90s. in period 80s pieces. <laughs> like, what's with the frilly shirts, man? Hey, man, it, chicks did the shirt yeah no but he's he, ha- he has a certain presence she's fighting for her own as to say it's uh, I was saying I was trying to relate to George uh, when I watched this with my wife uh, I was like this is from my point of view and I don't understand what this film is to women but from a from a guy's point of view it's like this is kind of your back to the future film you know for us it's yeah. like we gravitate to that but and I mean that there is a there is a reason I say that it's because of the period thing it's to sort mm-hmm. of lose yourself um, in that nostalgia in a period you know never lived in well it's the fact that it's been the same like what you're going through or this this you know this uh, this journey or whatever it's um, it's, it's yeah it's times that all young people have to go through this and I think that's what hits home with both Back to the Future and this is the fact that we see young people having to deal with in one film there's there's the the 50s and in this we're going back to the 60s mm. but we've been we were watching this in the 80s and then the 90s and obviously still mm. just just but, every month but, but you know like, um, like we said only... with with Back to the Future because it's a period film it stands of source, up it, today it, yeah, like holds, this film it, does it, it holds up better I mean yeah I say we've the, the, the thing <laughs> that do jar and stand out are the 80s bits they're yeah. the overly more the music uh, yeah it's yeah. the music really uh, more than anything and I think that's why it is you know a timeless classic I, I, I enjoy going back to it I think in terms of what works and what doesn't work I wouldn't say that anything sticks out other than that the, it's easy to look back now uh, 30 you know 30 40 years later and say that some of the music sticks out but it works it's, I think that what the interesting question is why did this become such a cult film is it just the story or was it really well what I don't understand is why it didn't get commissioned by other people because you know from the moment I watched it I mean I was obviously prime audience Mm -hmm. target and I I just fell in love with it loved all of every single aspect of it the the characters the the dancing the film the way it was set music why didn't anyone else see that potential I don't know if I, the part of me that's thinking um, obviously I wasn't a studio executive in the 80s as, as much as I wish I was um, but part of me is thinking it's because it was too adult whereas a lot of rom-coms are very family friendly safe and yeah. safe everyone can go and see them whereas this it is quite sexualized I mean yeah. even though it's not like outrageous there's no nudity really 
I mean, apart there's Swayze's topless a lot, but you know, none of She's us are topless. Topless, topless in a lot of scenes, with... which is not necessary, but it's not a problem it's for me. Fine, it's, it's fine, fine. totally fine. Totally um, fine. But it's the um, and there's a lot of it's the adult issues, like yes. the abortion, and the there's a lot of lot of grinding and a lot of yeah air humping as lot, well. Yeah, you know when they're apart, grinding. but they're still grinding. <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah, it's 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 an, the dance scenes are infectious, and I think. I don't know. I think there's one of those things where on paper you can say, oh, this feels a bit TV movie light sort of type thing. But it maybe it does take that chemistry of, you know, some great actors to to bring it to life mm. and to make it compelling. Whereas on paper it might be, oh, I don't know. I mean, you know, sort of the, the thing that I always remember, the, the you know, it's a feeling. It's a heartbeat. Go, 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 go. Touch on, my chest. On, on, on paper, that probably sounds a bit, you know, cheesy a bit, but on screen. A Swayze doing it. A Swayze doing mm. it, you know. It's, uh, and it's what, not too long. Answer. It's not too long a film. It's one no. hour 40. Yeah, one hour 40. As we said, you know, it's, you know, economic. No, but I think that's that's when it does very much firmly fit into the romantic comedy, co- uh, sorry, romantic comedy or just comedy in that it's not like, it's not trying to be a thriller. It's not, it's it's a story. It's trying to get a point across. It's got a very good structure, beginning, middle and end. And it's kind of like the Rocky montage of her getting better and better at dancing. Well, that's um, a, that is a great scene. Is it, the, you know, like every 80s film, you have to have a montage and that montage of her going back and down the steps and stuff like that. Yeah. Again, it's become so iconic. And as you said, that's the, the wardrobe production thing is you know starts off in a dowdy cardigans and then before she's bumping it up on screen and it's yeah it's great and there's there's so many iconic shots and the dancing is good i think i don't know as i said it's it's infectious you know it's like as you say that that whole scene where they're all in the breakout room um you know even the sort of the ballroom style stuff is all really really good yeah and i think what it says is that we i think that's We've talked about this before on the podcast, pre-internet, this was our go-to. This was how we, you know, it's how people were, just in the same way that we share memes, you know, we, we were discovering films and watching films together and, and, and experiencing life. It's that's escapism. Yeah, and this this is what you needed, and this is what we had. It was our it was our film collection. It was like I don't know, I'm not in the mood for that. Let's let's watch this, you know, or let's watch that. And there'd be other times as you got older, you'd watch other type of more serious films, or sometimes just like like we we talked about very recently when we recorded Golden Eyes. Like sometimes you just put on a Bond film because you just sit back and well, it's, it's, it's great it great hangover telly and you were mm. telling me Sophia that you watched it very recently after yeah, you and your Sunday girls last Sunday morning me and the girls yeah whereas a bit of they didn't take a lot of convincing I'm guessing absolutely not in fact should we put on <laughs> Ali said it was the best Sunday morning that she'd had in a long time wow yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah. we sat eat, eating bacon sandwiches watching whereas I Swayze uh, I watched it on the commute down to London on Monday morning surrounded by people tapping away in their laptop there's me, meanwhile, me in the corner. Until <laughs> 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 he was like, I can't believe you watched it on the train. that in public? I was, I was like, baby, I had to. Uh, I'm a you podcast know, professional, uh, I've, got to, I've got to get my time, my research in. Now, one thing, um, well, I, I obviously didn't feel comfortable watching this by myself in public like George. Mm-hmm. I watched this with my wife. And one thing she said that was interesting, she said she agreed that it's it's because I think her being French, she'd seen bits of this and obviously it would have been dubbed and uh, hadn't, hadn't watched it you know, in its entirety. And she said, it's very interesting what becomes a cult film. I mean, it's easy for Mm -hmm. us to stand back, but you wouldn't maybe have imagined, like you were saying before about on paper. Yeah. It's interesting that why this is... lightning in a bottle, isn't it? It's a concept. I mean, obviously, Swayze went on to do, you know, amazing things. And obviously the the director did, but I don't... I can't think of it. She just disappeared. Yeah, I I don't don't think of anything else she did. Maybe Swayze ended her career after you would have <laughs> trying thought, to get me off this film. <laughs> you would have thought she would have had so much potential. Well, that's it. You and know, been hot, hot property. I have a feeling that she was actually more. We're probably not giving her credit where it's due. I have a feeling that she was in a few TV series that maybe didn't make right. it across the pond. And our American listeners or our Canadian listeners, and I'm sure they'll they'll let us know. Yeah, but I, I mean, have a feeling but, that but, she was more than just these two films. But, but as you say, Sophia, it's like it's almost like you know you look at how. Julia Roberts' career, like, you know, Mm. blasted off with Pretty Woman. She'd obviously been in a few films before then, but it just jettisoned with Pretty Woman. It was a breakout role, and it showed her that she was a star. And in in this, you know, we've... We've talked about, you said, Charlie, you said some of her Jennifer Grey stuff is a little, her delivery's a little bit wooden. I think that's the only thing that stuck out this time. Is like, there's some lines, it was just like, she actually looks like she's struggling with talking. 
she comes across as nervous. But that, I think that's, that's what's that's great. What I mean. it's you like, realize it comes she's completely in awe of him. And she's just come across as like she's just like she's out of it. She's, she's got a crush. You're out of my league. Time. Sorry, I'm but, not singing hungry. Yet. No, the thing that uh, I, I don't know. I've I've sort of talked about this previously on podcasts. I've become a big softy since I've become a dad, and you know having having a little girl that scene where you know her dad's sitting out staring out on oh, on the lake yeah. and she's like daddy i'm sorry i let you down but you let me down i'm just like you you keep it together george keep it together <laughs> on the train on the London, train surrounded by, surrounded by professionals tapping away and i'm just biting my lip <laughs> stay strong <laughs> she's no longer his little girl anymore and that's when george realizes that his headphones aren't plugged in and the whole of the train <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's just staring at me crying <laughs> who's the idiot watching I say that I think she does, you know, she, it is a great role for her. And no, she yeah. told me by the end of it. I think, as I was saying to Soph just there, is that I wasn't sure is it bad acting or is it just awkward? And I think she does it brilliantly. She she does the whole journey of she starts off being very clunky and then she gets more confident. And yes, she goes to her dad for, for help, but it's for the right reasons. Supporting I've, cast are not bad. In I've this. I've actually put down here the uh, the story's almost Shakespearean oh, because there's that whole very deep, uh, very wow, deep, very deep because there's the bit where obviously we haven't talked about um, the fact that that Johnny's uh, a bit of a um, what's it sort of a a rent boy for the Cougars you know the fact that we need to cover and that. the fact that yes yeah, is, is it Mrs Pressman hello lover <laughs> <laughs> and there's that whole thing that he ditches her so she, to get him back she frames him yeah and then they have to reveal it's a bit like you know mistaken identity and it's like no but that couldn't have happened because i was with him all night yeah so yeah i i uh, enjoyed that um i mean there's, there's there's so many things i haven't um touched on i mean just some of the amazing fashion there's the knee-high socks you know and all the old people doing the dancing yeah um, bunny hop th- there's the other subplot of the uh the old couple that are the grifters the schumachers the, 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 the schumachers and the, yeah, the sweet little old lady yeah and they're robbing everyone I really? love that because you think so. There's awesome. a lot going on. There's, there's so much when when they say, "Oh yeah, I saw them," and it's like maybe they were things like she's just reaching here. Of course, they're not thieves. Like, oh my god, she's Sherlock Holmes. She's you cracked the case, baby. Um, and then you've got the whole Penny story. Yes, but is that Penny? Oh, Penny, the, the, the pen, no, dancer. The, the, oh yeah, the, the abortion. abortion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Get healthcare. Get uh, healthcare. You need to pay. It's very expensive. There's, it's, it's all right. I know a doctor that's passing through. <laughs> um, and there's obviously sleazy Robbie. Yeah. yeah. But it's very de- it's a, it is a very delicate subtext, the whole... Because um, I don't want to mention the dirty word in terms of films of this era, but in in Greece, I think there's some other... Is is there? Is it not like a, there's a, an abortion or there's a... Uh, there's yeah, a, I think there is. Yeah. But it, that, that was obviously a, lot, a bit before that, but that was another cult film yeah. dealing with similar themes. Oh, she, of, Rizzo gets, n- gets knocked yeah. up. Yeah, so but she's not knocked up. But this this is much more in the face. You see Penny in the bed, there's the whole doctor support. Whereas, it, whereas it's more of a conversation and it's a labeling thing in Greece yeah, in this. I, I think Apparently that's- on that, um, she they had to put tons of makeup on her for that um, scene where um, baby's dad comes to help yeah. her after the abortion to because make her look she's less so attractive. beautiful. Yeah, she's gorgeous. Yeah. Even like looking sweaty and messy and like, no, ill. No, you still they were like look- that, no, she still looks too pretty. We've got to dumb her down. Yeah. Because no, yeah. we were saying yeah, she, she's 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 a stunner. Because you you immediately assume she's so with I she's mean, with Swayze. To be fair, that uh, that scene where the the her and uh, baby are mirror dancing in oh, the in the leggings. You see that one's for the boys, isn't it? Ooh, and that's hungry eyes, isn't it? Yeah, that's Swayze's Phil's sitting there. Favorite on the, scene of the film. Ooh, it's you it's imagine. Yeah. It's good. It's good. What for Sweaty Swayze on the floor? Just, you know, just the two girls dancing. <laughs> yeah. It's very well choreographed. But that's something I wanted to point out is that what what was this film riding the wave of? And it's choreographed dance. Because you think about we've had, you know, we had Michael Jackson, we had Madonna. Mm, yeah. If there was anything that explained, we had MTV that was hitting the scene and MTV was all about what can we do really well? What looks amazing on screen? And what do we get to see in the end of this film? And it's one of the most iconic shots. It's when the lift. Uh, no, not the lift. It's when Swayze turns up and he's got all of his dancers behind him and he's oh, going yeah. down the main aisle in between the two audiences. The, 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 yeah. And, it, and it's, a, it's an Why iconic Why don't you get choreograph- choreography like that in real life? That's It'll come back. No, no, people but, now do it for their weddings. Flash they mobs. do that dance. That's true. Yeah. But you get um, flash mobs. I, speaking of choreography, I, th- I believe, I, I, I've turned my phone off so I can't double check on IMDb, but the dance choreographer 
Kenny Ortega went on to direct High School Musical and <gasps> lots of other film. things. So he's still going, uh, but he's obviously a vital piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Uh, giving all those, 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 giving Swayze his moves, basically. But what I think what's fair to say is I get the feeling that there was more films for, um, I don't know. That there seem to be less films like this that you could split down the middle for this one's for, for young boys and this one's for young girls. Now they seem to be trying to get everyone in to see the same films. So it's like make a Hunger Games trilogy or a Twilight trilogy or Harry Potter. They're trying to cover all bases, aren't well, they? Well, I suppose that's, that's why I'm just trying to think the most recent example was Greatest Showman was such a breakout hit. Yeah, because it was... It appealed you, to everyone. And you don't get... A, an original musical anymore it's always based off a stage show or something like that so yeah actually yeah usually a remake or something like that so bona fide you know musicals with original numbers are, are yeah a rarity these I'm days i'm also guessing that's one of the five musicals in your wife's collection <laughs> uh well i think it's one of the five I cd think, she owns. i think it's actually one of your own we actually listened to it in the car on the way up here wow okay so it's I'm, I'm Still sure. I haven't seen it. Sorry, don't hit me. But I'm sure, I haven't I'm, seen it. But everyone raised. I'm sure it's a big hit in the British. Wise household. It's a massive hit in the yeah. Wise yeah. household. Yeah. yeah. In terms of the the line, nobody puts baby in the corner. Technically, she's not in the corner. She's just behind a beam. It's just, just a support beam. beam. Yeah. But um, it's it's but when, But we talked about that whole the music coming on and it's movie magic isn't it That's the fact that it's a complete amazing. it's a completely 80s hit but just go with it because it's such a magical scene well I'm glad we got to this point so what do you think is actually happening because when I watched it this time I've when I've watched this film before I assumed in this part of the film that that track comes on and that they dance to it but when I watched it this time I realised that that's the theatrical that's the three theatricality is that what's actually happening is that they are doing the dance to a 60s track and we're getting the 80s track played over the top because, because we're 80s film because we're watching it from the 80s the only thing where that fourth wall is kind of broken well, that's really is really deep well no but what do you think it's but what are we supposed to believe that they are dancing to a track that hasn't been invented yet oh my god I've gone all back to the future yeah. So are they dancing to a track that I hasn't think this been is, written? I don't think they thought that far ahead. I think they chose they just, the tune, yeah. and apparently they chose that. That was the last yeah, one they went out through a of, bag like of tapes. Mm-hmm. thirty-five yeah. ones that were sent to them, and they were right up until the wire. They were doing the dance without the music to go and, to it. No, but that's, and, that's and my they, point. Is that I have a feeling that because you know they do the practice when they're doing the when they do the other show where they go yeah. to the other place, they're actually practicing to a different track, and they keep they put the track on and they do the dance to that track, and that's why I'm asking the question maybe I have gone too deep I think you're overthinking really it but like, I think what, it, they're taking poetic license that because I thought that they do that it's same fa- dance it, again at the end of this but what they actually do for the movie magic it's, it's is they a, play it's a different dance Charles okay. I, know, I think, it's, I think it's also a, a financial thing because they said they'd spent, they had such a limited budget they, they bought as many of the iconic the 60s tracks as they could but music licensing is really expensive so they needed just new songs for, for the mm. finale and I think they did the same for Greece, I think, because I was in. Did I tell you I was in Greece at high school? Only five times. Um, <laughs> but the the end song, obviously, you're the one I want, was written spe- uh, specifically for the film. Um, so I think sometimes they do it. Yeah, we need a a current hit or a new hit uh, or it's yeah to save money essentially there's also characters in the film who are singing along to I've had the time of my life well, well, like, Swayze, Swayze's singing it too isn't he yeah. so, but what I will have to show you and I'll put a link on the blog as well there's I don't know if I've shown it to you before but there's a bunch of videos on YouTube where they basically remove the music from key mu- music videos and film scenes and they've taken that whole scene and they put it basically put in the sound effects but there's no music so you just like see Swayze like, like I've seen it I've seen it yeah, and yeah. it's like, it's like <laughs> and, and then like shuffling shoes and she's like <laughs> <laughs> and like there's no music and then everyone's like woo <laughs> There's nothing going on, Awkward. and it's and it's almost like yeah, if, if behind the scenes. But um, yes, I think we'll have to. Um, have that to have must another... have been like you know you, they would have been doing all this dancing. Yeah, maybe they were playing some music. Or I think yeah, sometimes they play a temp track. I think film music scenes in films are very odd. Yeah, sometimes they just have a a beat so everyone knows what beat to get to, and that's why some of the funny things. Um, one of my favorite things in films: look what the extras are doing. They might be do- like dancing to a completely different song. <laughs> So yeah, I think kind of uh, done the film. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We haven't talked about 
the lift scene in the lake. Well, we were talking about this uh, off chat because we don't like to include you in that because, okay, you know, sure. we still go to our den. surprise me. Yeah. And um, I was I was saying about how in the end scene, when they do the lift. Yeah. It's it, not as I, I think it's badly shot because you've got the audience on both sides. They're doing it in the aisle and it mm-hmm. would have it, it made sense and it would have looked great if you were in the room. But from cinematography, it's not as, as, as when they're in the lake. Amazing. That's that's when it's... That's, it's a great shot. Yeah. And, uh, and it's fun and it's building tension, love and desire. And one of us wants to jump on Swayze. All of us want to jump on Swayze by that point. Uh, can I ask, Sylvia, because you're you're quite a small person. How many times have you have you done that lift with your husband? Obviously. Yeah, we <laughs> has, has we been, attempted the lift. Uh, has it been successful? Lot. Never. No. <laughs> has he moved um, on to I mean, now I just practice? I don't practicing? think I'm a naturally gifted uh, dancer. Have you tried in a swimming pool? Uh, no. Or and a we lake. normally try it after about three bottles of wine, which... <laughs> Mm, yeah. Could have some. The kind results of are hilarious yeah. and but, um Actually, Phil's done it with Lexi. Oh, okay. Yeah. Your daughter. Yeah, yeah that makes more sense. Who's yeah. Like eight and yeah. like a twig. Yeah. Okay. He can do it with her, but I mean, yeah, that's a hard one. Yeah, someone. And it means nothing to her. Daddy, why do you keep asking to do that? <laughs> do the lift. Shut up and watch the film. <laughs> Don't care about the. Just, just ignore the scenes about the abortion. Just watch the film. Then you'll understand why Daddy's doing the lift. Yes, someone did that at one of my work's Christmas parties a few years ago. I was unaware and dancing to around and got kicked in the face oh, by ooh. a lady yeah, yeah. with a high heel ooh. and did they manage the they, they managed the lift because she, she, it was again it was a small lady small lady right. and a big man mm-hmm. big big muscly big, man big muscles. Uh, I think they I feel did. like we're going to have to add a disclaimer to this podcast don't try this at home do not try you have, you know. um, but yeah one of the sort of sad things I thought in that uh, documentary on Netflix the movies that made us they go back to the, the holiday camp and the lake's not there anymore I they've, know. they've drained it and so the the um, producer Linda Gottlieb walks out into the, and it's just basically like a field that's sad and, that's and they've even still got the breeze blocks where, where they actually did on. where that baby stood on for the lift in the, in the water well, so yeah it's really sad I suppose <laughs> so apparently on IMDB they um you Always know, take it with a pinch of salt yeah well they for that scene they filmed it in October time and it was so cold explains the nipples you couldn't do <laughs> a close up on their faces because the lips were blue right. and they apparently were spray painting the trees yes, because so they, it was autumn again wow. yeah, to, to, yeah. Uh, to film out, they had to film because of budget they had to film out of season uh-huh. so yeah they filmed like September October time yeah. and I think they had to film in two different holiday camps locations yeah. they did the um, staff quarters on one location yeah. and then and it was it was it the the lights that you see uh, they just made them to say oh, it's the same place yeah. because look they've got the same lights movie magic So we, we've covered the the iconic shots. Okay, thanks. Is there anything else uh, that works doesn't work that struck you going back watching it for uh, the fourth time this month, so no, I mean, there is there is that real believable love story between the two of them. Yeah, because I think that is worth pointing out is that it starts off that she wants him and he wants nothing to do with her. Yeah. And then she shows him a side of himself he didn't really want yeah. to say. And he says that. It's, it is nicely it's done. It's lovely. Lovely to watch. Yeah. I think the parents thing is a bit... Is that 80s, the whole thing... Uh, you know, it's like I just I want your dad to put his arm around me. I had a dream, and me, you were walking well, again, next that, to your dad. That's, your dad that's put the his class arm. thing, isn't it? It's yeah, just wants to be accepted because he was he's like New York uh, labels and painters fifty seven. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, and he's he's not gonna he's not going to Yale like bloody Robbie. The shit. The shit. <laughs> Well, yeah, I haven't got anything else to add. Is it time? Is it's it? It's time to release them. Release Jeff and Celine. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. Coulda, woulda, shoulda is where George, normally George, unless Sophie's turned up with. Uh, well, I think you've you've seen the same Netflix thing, right? Yeah. So you can chip in. So yeah, Coulda, woulda, shoulda is when we talk about people who almost got the role. Oh, yeah. So when we were talking about that screen test where they had the smoldering chemistry, the studio um, also wanted to test a few other people. So they tested... What you remember? Uh, Sarah Jessica Parker. Sarah Jessica Parker. Apparently, Winona Ryder was also considered. Really? But I don't think they screen tested her. Um, but in terms of the, the leads for Johnny, <laughs> there was Benicio Del Toro. Uh, was, uh, wow. uh, was He can uh, dance. He, can he now? 
Um, but the other it's one, you're too much of a baddie, though. But, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, it just looks evil. Just um, looks evil. But the one that you will, uh, you'll love this. Billy Zane and, oh and he and they've got footage of him in the screen tests and it's it's cringeworthy isn't yeah. it he's just like, oh, it's just like oh, <laughs> Billy Zane permanently got a cold yeah yeah it's just yeah why don't you fight harder baby like oh god cram it Zane <laughs> get me Swayze <laughs> get me snake hip Swayze yeah I love, but I want to see I mean you know just to do, are there any others no no that, that, I well, mean just to dovetail no. into our special features this is DVD. Additional features. Yeah. The film I now want to see, from what I've heard from George, and what we've been talking about today, is I want to see the film where it's about how Swayze says he can't dance, but in actual fact, he's a snake hips professional. <laughs> that he's an amazing dancer, that his mum was a dance teacher, and that he just couldn't do it because he was just too scared of being too good. Something just, along those I lines. I just don't want to injure my knee again. Yeah. Well, I mean, my suspicious business would be, I mean, the question of... What happens next? I yeah, know. what happens to the two of them? What and would you like to see happen to the well, two of them? Well, I mean, I remember thinking about this. A lot. A lot, yeah. Mm, fan when fiction. I was a teenager, I was like, well, what, well, what, what does this mean? I mean, he's come back for her. Mm -hmm. Where's he come back from? What's he been doing? Mm -hmm. And what, what, what does this mean for them now? Is she just going to go back and that's her summer romance? Oh. So, so my, she, did my, she join the Peace Corps? Well, that's my, my idea that... It's Dirty Dancing, Saigon Shakedown. So, so he becomes a soldier. So, so, so Baby's um, in the Peace Corps in Vietnam. Right. He's entertaining the troops and together through the medium of dance, they, 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 they win. They end the war. They end the war. They end the war. So That yeah. is a brilliant idea. So you make up. But apparently there is a sequel, a, a direct to vi I think it was director video. Uh, yeah, I don't. Do you dancing Havana Ninth, <laughs> and involving none of the original? Yes, cast. no, no, no. <laughs> no one wanted to do it, no, did they? No, no I, don't, I don't think there's even a you know an awkward cameo from anybody. Um, I think it's completely different story, but another sort of tale of of young love. And it's featuring Billy Zane, <laughs> Billy Zane <laughs> and Sarah Jessica Parker. <laughs> finally gets his crack, his shot of the title. Um, so yes, um, I, I feel, so you haven't seen Havana Ninth. I don't think I have. Uh, In fact, I'm going to watch that and yeah. you're going to watch it and I, I don't think it might take any convincing to get Phil to watch it as oh, well okay. so yeah I think I think that's it well thank uh, you for just, coming on so yes. well, thank you for enjoyed. having me yeah, enjoyed thank you. really enjoyed it thank you for joining us and uh, I, I don't know I, I, I'd i like to do the bodyguard I, it's, <laughs> did <laughs> I just it's, say that is this a confession yeah I'd like to uh, I, that, that, that film's got a well it's but in I, a similar it's a similar thing with um with Dirty Dancing, it was a film that I was forced to watch at gunpoint and, and listen to the soundtrack and repeatedly. And listen to the soundtrack. Yeah. Um, and, and it's female and it's, company, and so yeah, you you you're like, well, yeah, yeah, it's okay. And, and it's another one of my. I think it's in my wife's top five. <laughs> it's the fourth. <laughs> it's musical. the fourth DVD Free musical. Yes, we were actually listening to the soundtrack class doing some cleaning earlier. That's great soundtrack. Great another soundtrack. Bodyguard's on another level in terms yeah. of soundtrack for me. Yeah, but I think Dirty Dancing's probably. I don't know. And we can maybe justify that a bit more. Because Kevin Costner's in it, and there's some guns in it. Yeah, as well. yeah there's some violence. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's quite yeah. scary. Yeah. So yeah, su yeah, super for guys. Some chase scenes and things. True, true. Yeah, yeah so like you'll be back to your comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay, well, um, yes, thank you again, Sophia. It's been Thank a lot of fun. So, yeah, until next time. Uh, I have no idea what we're going to line up next time. We've got a few irons in the fire. I think we're going to try and get out of uh, our sort of 1990s. Well, would this be 80s? No, we need to get out of 995. 995. The last three films have been 995. Yeah, so we're going to... Uh, apart from this one. Um, um, yeah, there's a few few things, I'll say. Um, so, yeah, this has been Retro Ramble. I've been Charlie McGee. I've been George McGee. I've been Sophia McGee. No, now wise. No now wise. wise. Thank you for coming, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.